We have two presenters this evening. He is also the community director, community development director for the city of Sumner, a position he has held since 2005. He has over 20 years experience in leadership positions within Western Washington communities, including service as planning manager at the city of Bremerton, director of planning and building at Grace Harbor County, and community development director for the city of Shulman. He earned his master's degree in urban and regional planning from Eastern Washington University. And throughout his career, Paul has focused on vision-based, long-range planning efforts for his employer and communities. He's a former board member of the Planning Association of Washington and has presented at over 50 short courses on local planning, teaching comprehensive planning basics, the role of the planning commission, historic preservation planning, and promoting vision based planning, and now the new short course, Integrating Urban Forestry with Your Local Plans. He's a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners as well, AICP. In his spare time, and mine as well, we enjoy sailing, rehabilitating our historic home, and traveling to visit our kids and grandkids. The stuff I really want to get to that I think is the, the core of, of the presentation and, and sort of helps uh, tie it into the urban forestry topic and towards the end. So I'm going to go through this first stuff kind of fast. Um, everything I'm going to be talking about tonight sort of goes back to that section in the Revised Code of Washington and a few other supporting sections, but the core of the Growth Management Act, if you really want some fascinating reading some evening, is RCW 3678. So what am I going to talk about for about 30 minutes? Um, a little bit on why the GMA, the Growth Management Act, even exists, sort of the history of how we got to where we are, why this is the planning legislation that guides planning in the state of Washington. A very quick brush of that, obviously. It's a long story, and I don't have time to tell the whole fascinating story. What are the goals of the Growth Management Act? These are specific goals that are actually listed in that RCW. Um, what are the components of a plan? This is where we're going to start to get into the part that sort of ties into making uh, presentation later on this evening, a way to understand how a plan is put together and how it is tied together with the structure of a good comprehensive plan is. I call that the planning pyramid. That's my invention. No one else's is not in the RCW. Um, and a little bit about how urban forestry sort of fits into this, this fabric uh, of comprehensive plans. And I'll actually be talking about that after Mickey's talked about uh, particulars of urban forestry. So that'll be later on this evening. Um, I have an ulterior motive. I used to call this an ulterior motive, but someone corrected me. Um, and that is to provide you some ideas, some tools, uh, so that you can understand how urban forestry should become part of one of the fundamental building blocks of government decision making, and that is the comprehensive plan. So why the Growth Management Act? Where did it come from? Why here now in 2012, we're now 22 years or so into planning under a very difficult and complex planning uh, legislation, Planning Enabling Act, uh, for this state. Other, other states, each state has their own enabling legislation that guides urban planning. Uh, and some of them are easier to do than the Growth Management Act is. We have chosen a very difficult route, uh, but there's a reason why we got there. In the 1980s, and actually before the 1980s even, um, citizens were starting to recognize some problems out there. They were seeing that the way we were growing was starting to cause some side effects uh, that, that weren't necessarily uh, desirable. They were seeing increased congestion on our roads and highways. They were seeing a loss of attractiveness for economic development as our development pattern became quite ugly in many ways. Um, we weren't attracting new employment. We weren't attracting new businesses because our state was losing its quality of life in some ways. They saw a loss of resource-based lands that have been the historic driver of our economy. Those were the forest lands, the farmlands, and to some lesser degree, the mineral resource lands. Uh, and they saw that the type of development that was happening next door was harming the rights, the property rights of the neighbors. Uh, so the citizens began to get pretty upset about this, and they were starting to cry out, we want you to do some things differently in the planning world. We want the cities and communities to sort of address some of these questions on the top part of the slide. Um, and they also said, hold down our taxes so we don't have to spend so much money building new roads. Uh, solve that congestion problem. Protect that quality of life that we see slipping away from us, and protect those forests and farmlands. And they were pretty upset about it, and they started really demanding that the legislature look at these issues. 
Um, so the legislature did, and voila, that's not viola, that's voila. Um, I had it spelled wrong in a previous slide, and everyone says, why is he talking about a medium-sized string instrument in his, uh, in his presentation? So the legislature, over two different sessions, 1990 and 91, adopted the Growth Management Act in, in a couple of pieces. And look at some of the language. This is out of that RCW I was talking about. This is section 010, the very first section of the Growth Management Act. And it talks about the intent and the reason the Growth Management Act was adopted. And you can read it. I don't have time. We don't want to take time. But look at the words that are in red there. It that was recognized that the development patterns, development, uh, the manner of development that had been going on historically was a threat to the environment, to sustainable economic development, and to the health, safety, and high quality of life enjoyed by the citizens of, of the state of Washington. And that was the basic impetus uh, of, you know, regarding the Growth Management Act. I won't go over these next two slides. These are the goals. I said there's specific goals in the Growth Management Act. There's now 14 of them. My slides are a little dated, but I only show you 13. Uh, but, but these are what they're all about, you know, address sprawl, uh, make sure we, we have our, an efficient transportation system, that we deal with housing and housing affordability, we protect property rights, we get permits issued in an efficient manner, uh, we protect those natural resource lands, you know, you can sort of see these goals address that basic intent statement from a slide ago. So what does it all really boil down to? What does the Growth Management Act really try to do? Uh, just a couple of simple things. It tries to assure that rural areas sort of remain rural, that we don't keep gobbling them up with development. That's sort of addressing that, protect those, those resource lands, those farmlands and those uh, forest lands particularly. That has to do then with finding a way to curb sprawl. Um, urban areas should be where the more, most of the new growth goes. And that's going to put some pressure on urban areas. The urban areas may change over time if we focus more of our development into those urban areas. But that allows us to be more efficient in our use of, of public infrastructure, of utility pipes in the ground, of roads, and, and basically public expenditures. And, but it also may require us to think about higher housing density. So that was sort of a trade-off. But something that's new under the Growth Management Act is something that's less, uh, less easily detected, it's more subtle. And that is the Growth Management Act introduced a paradigm, oh, I said that word, I hate that word, but there it was. Introduces a concept of planning that's more citizen-based, it's more participatory than the way it had been done previous to the 1990s. And that's what I really want to focus on for the rest of the presentation. GMA actually has a section that requires community participation as the basis of how you write a comprehensive plan and how you adopt regulations that implement that comprehensive plan later. And it also requires absolute consistency between the policy decisions you make in the, in the comprehensive plan and what you do in the <coughs> regulatory world. And I'll talk about that in a bit more detail in the next few minutes. So then you have to write these comprehensive plans that begin to implement these big ideas in the Growth Management Act. And they have you know, some pieces, some, some characteristics that the Act actually spells out. So every comprehensive plan now around the state has is generally similar to the comprehensive plan of a neighboring jurisdiction. Every jurisdiction is doing basically the same type of comprehensive plan now. Uh, and that wasn't necessarily true before GMA. But it has these, these characteristics now. One is it has certain elements like chapters. There's a, a land use chapter, a transportation chapter, a housing chapter, a capital facilities chapter, a utilities chapter. And if you're a county, you have to do a rural chapter. But then you can do any other chapters that you want that seem appropriate for your community, an economic development chapter, an environment chapter, a parks and recreation chapter. There's, there's a long list of additional optional chapters that communities will put in their comprehensive plan, sort of depending on what is most valuable and important in that community. But the act spells out those first five, or if you're county six, required elements. But there's also some character, characteristics of a comprehensive plan um, that are less clearly spelled out in some cases in the RCW, but are definitely there. I won't talk about all these except the second bullet point there, the consistency requirement. And here's the idea of consistency. What the Growth Management Act says is there has to be several different types of consistency in your comprehensive plan. One is it has to be internally consistent, meaning that what you say in the land use chapter and what you say in the transportation chapter, and I'm just giving you one example, have to be consistent with, you, with each other. You can't say in your land use chapter, we want a quiet single family neighborhood here on the map, and then have your transportation chapter show a four lane freeway going through that same area. I mean, that's a very gross and, 
and simplistic explanation. The, the idea of internal consistency actually gets way more complicated than that when you're writing a comprehensive plan. But those basic principles have to apply. There's also a type of internal consistency that has to do with the calculations, the, uh, the data used in a comprehensive plan. For example, population projections are the whole, uh, probably the most important and fundamental basis for a comprehensive plan. You start with how many people you expect to see coming in your community over the next 20 years. Then you have to plan the right land use layout. You have to plan enough area for the right amount of housing to accommodate that population. The right transportation system sized properly to move that population around the community. And all the numbers then have to begin to line up. The housing units you're planning for, the population you're planning for, the capacity of the streets you're planning for, all those calculations have to be consistent. What I want to spend more time tonight is that second bullet point on this slide, and that's a type of consistency that's also clearly required by GMA that says that development regulations that you adopt after you've adopted your comprehensive plan have to be consistent with the goals and the policies and the principles laid out in that comprehensive plan. If you say in your comprehensive plan that you want mixed-use development in your downtown area, you have to amend your zoning code to allow mixed use in your downtown area. You can't have a zoning code that says no mixed use in the downtown area. Those things, by law, have to be consistent. So what happens in the early stages of planning under GMA, when communities are sitting down together to write their comprehensive plan and writing policies and general statements about what the future should look like in the community, has a lot to do with what the regulations and rules are later. Um, there's also a less clearly uh, stated intent in GMA that local elected officials should pay attention to the comprehensive plan goals and policy when they decide how to spend money, when they decide how to form partnerships with other organizations, and, and all those sorts of things. This is another way to look at that concept. This is what I mentioned a minute ago, the planning period. The idea here is, if you actually read this from the bottom up, is the process of planning under GMA starts in a very broad sense and then works towards the specific. The broad approach starts with the community sitting down together. This is usually called visioning workshops or visioning public meetings that are, that are working on visioning. Where the community decides together what they want the community to look like 20 years into the future or, or, or longer, farther out. Then they continue to work and develop specific goals and policies that add more detail to that vision. I'll give you an example of this later. Then, and that's basically the comprehensive plan, the visioning and the, comp the community goals. That's, that's the plan. But then the consistency uh, requirement comes in as you move further up to the pyramid when you get to implementation strategies. Regulations, budgets, programs, partnerships you form all need to be consistent with that vision and with those goals and policies uh, that sprung from that vision. That's the idea of, um, once again, consistency expressed a different way. So you move from a community conversation to uh, community development. And I wish I had time to get on my soapbox and tell you uh, why that phrase is important to me. But you move up to that desired future and develop a strong community. Uh, here's a real example of that. So let's say your vision says this. You want a small town that's pedestrian oriented, has lots of amenities in the downtown, mixed use in your downtown. You want, you want an active, diverse living environment, you know, like downtown Bellingham or like Fairhaven. Um, then you might adopt some goals that are more specific. Okay, so the goal is to make downtown a vibrant activity center. There's going to be other goals that say make downtown a mixed use environment with housing present. And, you know, but this is one. Uh, so follow that vision with a more specific statement about vibrant activity level. Then you adopt a policy that supports that goal, which is to be more vibrant, we need to add housing to the downtown area. So you're starting to build more specificity into your goal and policy group. Then moving beyond the comprehensive plan, you have to implement that idea. So you may have to amend your zoning code so that residential activity are allowed in the downtown area. You'd be surprised until GMA came along, and even still to this day, how many communities don't allow residences in the commercial zones, in the downtown zone. Uh, even if there's upper floors of buildings that are vacant, you can't use them for apartments because the zoning doesn't allow it. But to have a consistency that GMA allows, you would have to, if you said the things you've seen on the screen about what you want your downtown to look like, you'd have to amend your zoning code to allow residential use in the downtown area somewhere. And then you can go beyond regulations. You can talk about the fire code. You know, you may have to try to remove some barriers that may, there may be to developing those buildings downtown to allow that residential activity, like maybe the sprinkler requirements are a barrier. Um, 
and it can go even beyond that. The city has uh, decisions they're going to make about um, uh, how to spend money, and one of the things they might do is spend money in the downtown uh, in some way to spur that kind of development to happen. In the, in the city I work for, we actually own a block of, of property in the downtown area. Uh, until the housing market crashed, we were well along in um, building our own mixed-use development in the downtown where the city would be a partner with a private developer to build that uh, as sort of a kickoff project, a, a project that got that ball rolling in our downtown area. Uh, we still hope to get there someday, but here's the city spending money consistent with the comprehensive plan. Um, and you might also choose who you partner with and what sorts of activities uh, based on consistency with all the ideas on the slide. We uh, partner with our downtown association, the Sumner Downtown Association, to promote a lot of uh, festivals and, and uh, evening activities in the downtown area. So that's just, you know, the way that you need to show consistency with your comprehensive plan all the way through all your governmental activities and decisions. Um, so in summary, the, the point here is plans are holistically conceived, they're internally consistent. Development regulations, city budgets, and all the activities of government in some cases must, and in many cases at least should be, uh, consistent. Uh, with the goal policy set in that comprehensive plan. And, and here's where we begin talking about the tie-in uh, with urban forestry, and I'll flesh that out later in the second half of my remarks. And that is, if you plan on standing before your city council or any other decision-making body in your community and asking them to make the right decisions to support whatever is important to you, but let's use urban uh, forestry for tonight as an example, if you don't have goal and policy underpinnings in your comprehensive plan that you can show them, that tells them they should and must make the right decision regarding urban forestry, you're not on as strong a ground as you should be. So communities need to think about infusing policy statements and uh, a background, a policy background for whatever interest is important to them in their comprehensive plan so later it can be held up to decision makers and say, look, the community has spoken. They have put forth a policy framework that says you should be supporting urban forestry. Look at the comprehensive plan and you should be able to point to uh, many, many goals and policies uh, that do that for you. And I'll talk more about that in the second half of the presentation. <laughs>